Hello, my name is Margot Mountra and I'm a sport and exercise physician from Canada and I'm very happy to be with you today to uh, spend the next 15 minutes with you talking about harassment and abuse in sport. I start off today's talk with two photos of, of people that maybe you may be familiar with. Uh, one is a, a speed skater from Korea uh, who has um, reported allegations of harassment and abuse as well as another Korean triathlete who committed suicide in 2020 uh, after having reported allegations of harassment and abuse from her coach. And I show you these photos to, to emphasize that the people and the concepts we're talking about are actually these things happen to people, real life people whose lives are impacted by harassment and abuse in sport. And here's another picture of a report that was released in July 2020 of abuse within uh, amateur sport in Japan. So these things do occur and they happen around the world and I'm really excited to talk to you today on how we can all play a role in making sure that sport is safe for our athletes. So today I'll talk through three different parts. Uh, we'll spend some time reviewing the science, look at the Olympic Games, and what your role as a team physician could be. So the IOC started off by publishing consensus statements in 2007 on sexual harassment and then in 2016 expanding beyond sexual harassment to psychological, physical abuse and neglect. Safe sport is defined as an athletic environment that is respectful, equitable and free from all forms of harassment and abuse. Psychological abuse is defined as a pattern of deliberate, prolonged and repeated non-contact behaviors within a power relationship differential and this form of abuse is at the core of all other forms of abuse. Physical abuse, as you can imagine, is the non-accidental trauma or physical injury that can occur by intentionally, not within the context of play, but intentionally punching, beating, kicking, etc. But within sport, it can also be inappropriate um, exercise for either age, physique, skill level, or forcing to be in to to train while injured or in pain, forced alcohol or systemic doping practices. Sexual abuse is any conduct of a sexual nature, whether non-contact, contact, or penetrative, where consent is either coerced or manipulated or cannot be given. So as in the case of a child, um, cannot understand the repercussions of a decision to consent. And so by nature, any sexual activity with a child is abuse in, by definition. Neglect is the failure of an athlete or a coach, sorry, more of a coach or a member of the entourage to meet that athlete's physical or emotional needs and or, and or a failure to protect them from exposure to danger. So this can happen by failing to give them food uh, when they are in need or water for rehydration or exposing them to unsafe training um, environments. So the IOC conceptual model for harassment and abuse starts off as a cultural context of differentials of discrimination. So these power differentials may be um, related to the athlete's sex, the gender, race, athletic ability, they're all listed there in the blue column. So these discriminations over time if allowed to persist in sport can lead to harassment and abuse and I mentioned the four types, psychological, physical, sexual and neglect. At the bottom of the black column, you can see the different mechanisms by which these are portrayed in sport. So it can be either contact or non-contact, cyberbullying, bullying, or hazing. On the green column are the different outcomes of the abuse, and they're um, separated into two categories, and that can be athlete impacts or organizational impacts. And I will add one more, and that is the impact on families and teammates. So let's look at the science. Uh, non-accidental violence occurs in all sports and at all levels 
with a higher risk in both elite athletes, children, athletes who identify as LGBTQ, or athletes with a disability. We know the prevalence in some forms of abuse, such as psychological, sexual, and physical, in certain populations. And we know more often in the literature that the perpetrators are often more often reported to be male, more often to be reported as coaches, but more recently we're seeing evidence of peers and teammates being the perpetrators as well, unfortunately, as team physicians. Victims more often reported to be female than male. However, this does not mean that males are, are exempt. Of course, we do know that there are reports of male, males having been subjected to harassment and abuse within the sporting context. So how does it happen? Well, I'm going to paint for you the uh, perfect recipe or the perfect storm for this. It happens where you've got a perpetrator with high inclination or motivation to abuse within a sport culture where there's low protections, so no policies, procedures, no checks and balance, where this person's allowed to, to um, function in the silo without any, any checks and balances. In the situation at the same time where you may have an athlete with high vulnerability for any number of reasons, as according to that blue column in the model. So what are the impacts? And I've listed them here on the with the athlete as the center, and you can see the many different aspects of the athlete's life that can be affected by harassment and abuse. Now, not all athletes will have all of these effects, and certainly Different athletes within the same context may have different effects. But what we do know is that for some athletes, the impact of harassment and abuse can be devastating and long-lasting. So the physical impacts can be either direct physical trauma, and you can see in this situation where the coach has kicked the athlete, and the trauma can ensue because of this physical contact. The physical context uh, can also be from excessive training, overuse injuries with forced training, injuries caused by excessive stretching, or using exercise as a form of punishment. Neglect, the physical outcomes of neglect can be heat or cold exposure illnesses, dehydration, malnutrition, or injuries from an unsafe training environment. Physical impacts of sexual abuse, of course, unwanted pregnancy and or sexually transmitted infections or local trauma. Medication abuse can also have physical impacts on the athlete. Uh, we all know of the impacts of forced doping with anabolic steroids and the risk of early, too early a return to play following injury. And there's also medication abuse uh, by physicians treating athletes inappropriately with unnecessary interventions as well. There's a lot of mental health sequelae to harassment and abuse, and I've listed them all here for you to read. We are quite familiar with these, and in fact, this is probably the most common presentation from harassment and abuse, is the psychological impact from, from the abuse. We also know that harassment and abuse can affect cognition, concentration, memory, emotions, and may actually result in behavioral changes that can be just quite disruptive on a team with either risk-taking or just social behavioral changes within the team. So for some athletes, harassment and abuse can be far-reaching and express itself in many different ways. So what's the impact on sport itself as a system? Well, athletes' performance will be impaired. And there is evidence that athletes who have been harassed and abused are more likely to dope or cheat. They will drop out early and will have more challenges with their adjustment post-sport. On sport organizations themselves, we will have loss of our athletes and reduced performance, loss of medal opportunities, and as I mentioned, increased risk of doping or cheating. There's also damage to the reputation, loss of sponsorship, because companies won't want to invest in a sport that's, um, that has been tainted by harassment and abuse. We will lose fans who will not watch or support or, or uh, financially support us. And there's as general asset depreciation. There's also evidence of the indirect abuse, which often can occur in children where they witness the abuse in other people. And this indirect abuse is the effect that harassment and abuse can have on teammates or families that are, are not actually the, the direct 
victim or survivor of the abuse, but rather indirect. And this is something that can be significant on other members. We'll move now to the Olympic Games and talk just briefly about what is in place. There's a Games Time Framework first, first implemented in 2016, which outlines the rules and regulation for safe sport. And there are educational programs that are involved for athletes to participate as well as a safeguarding officer that will hear allegations of abuse and harassment. Now, not just hear them, but there's a whole mechanism in place for investigations, for a hearing, and for sanctionings, if appropriate. There's many educational opportunities available for you to download from the IOC. And here's the web link on this slide. There's an awareness animation for youth athletes that will allow them to learn a bit about it and start a discussion. There's an e-learning course for athletes, which is um, also for coaches and members of the entourage. And there's different courses within this. There's four courses uh, within this particular module. And they're talking about recognition, the impacts, and how to report. And it actually empowers the athletes for, to develop skills uh, to advocate for themselves. So online, free, and I encourage you to utilize these courses with your athletes. There's an e-learning tool on sexual harassment and abuse where you click on one of these nine individuals and they come forward and tell their story and we learn about the different aspects of sexual abuse through their particular stories. Very interesting interactive module uh, on how to um, improve the sport environment. For the youth athlete, there's a draw the line quiz, which is quite an interesting way for the youth to engage in the topic. We'll finish off today with your role as a team physician. What can you do to prevent? Well, make sure that your organization has an athlete protection policy, codes of practice, education and training programs, and complaint and support mechanisms, as well as monitoring and evaluating the program. So if you're working with a team, do you have these things in place? And if not, please implement them and work with other members of the sport organization to develop them, implement them, and evaluate them. Please be sure as a team physician that you follow your medical codes with the specific roles and responsibilities, the professional boundaries with respect to relationships as well as ethical behaviors. And if you don't have one, the Olympic Movement Medical Code is specifically designed for sport medicine physicians. It's a great document. It's on the web, free of charge. Please look it up. Please beware as a clinician of the different athlete presentations. I've listed them all here. And in fact, not every athlete that presents with this has been harassed or abused. But if you see a constellation of these things that aren't making sense, the injury patterns that don't make sense with the mechanism of injury, the mental health presentations that just aren't making sense, if you're seeing these things Together, please think about it. Keep your mind aware and thinking and then ask the athlete. You know, in other athletes that present like this, they may have been harassed or abused in their, in their life outside or inside of sport. And if that's you, you can talk to me about it. Is this, could this possibly be you? And then you've just opened the door for them and you've given them permission. If they don't talk today, they may in the future because you've opened the door for them. How would you manage disclosures? Well, we have a clinical approach to the ACL injury, to the shoulder injury. We need to have a clinical approach to managing allegations. So first of all, give the athlete permission to talk, acknowledge their bravery to talk, ensure the confidentiality within the limitations. Do not denigrate the perpetrator. Avoid leading questions and listen to the athlete. Stop what you're doing, put your pen down, Look them in the eye and acknowledge what they're saying. Listen and take the time. You will finish your clinic late and it's worth the effort. Keep good records. Most important, you must stop the abuse because if you do not stop it, you become complicit to it. Report it. Stop it. And then finally, look after their physical and psychological health with an interdisciplinary team. So who is your, who's your mental health support? Who's your social worker that you would support? Who's the lawyer that you would consult? Who within your milieu is someone that can be part of your interdisciplinary team? And don't forget, support the teammates and the families. So thank you. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about this topic. And more importantly, I thank you in particular for protecting your athletes against harassment and abuse in sport.